Shall we start? You know, the long, the sooner we start, the longer I can take. So, let's let's make a start. Um, it's fair to admit that I know more about the first word of the title than the last word of the title. How many of you see yourselves as teachers? If you know, if you were filling in a form, um, you'd see. Yeah, I, I, I teach. How many of you would see yourself as computer scientists? Okay, my apologies in advance for all of the daft things I'm going to say, on either count, actually. Um, this works much better as conversation than presentation. There may be time for questions at the end, you never know. But please feel free to interrupt, to add, to contribute to this as we're going through, rather than waiting for the final bit. It's preamble so far. Hi there, I'm well, thank you. How are you? <laughs> okay, let's make a start then. Um, so where we're going over the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do. I'm coming at this from the point of view of a primary practitioner, which point I expect very, lots of people to leave, but hopefully some of this is relevant to those of you who are working in secondary education. Talk a little about more traditional approaches to pedagogy. We will nod in the direction of the great heroes of the domain. Um, share some of the results from a survey which we do with new students at Roehampton in terms of learning style and then look particularly at a number of different pedagogic approaches which apply in terms of technology education in general and I think particularly well to computer science education. So we'll talk about Papert and constructionism, we'll talk about Prensky's partnering part pedagogy, I've got a bit on game-based learning to throw in, look in the direction of connectivism, learning theory for a digital age, talk a little about work-based learning, and then some of the analogies or the parallels you can draw between agile software development and agile teaching, and then talk at the very end about the elephant in the room, which is assessment, perhaps. Anyhow, this is where I work, or strictly speaking, this is where my vice chancellor works. This is Froebel College at Roehampton University. I have an office made out of breeze blocks somewhere off picture there. Um, like, other like some other universities, Roehampton is collegiate. So I'm based at Froebel College, which is named after the German educationist Friedrich Froebel, who invented the kindergarten. If you look at Mitch Resnick, father of scratch, is LWF 12 talk. He says, the greatest invention of all, not the book, not the internet thing, is the kindergarten. And we've got a picture there of a 19th century German kindergarten. Would it pass its EYFS Ofsted inspection? I'm not absolutely certain that the, the level of supervision is entirely appropriate, but we certainly have meaningful activity going on. Look, these children are learning things. The grown-ups may be engaged in other tasks, but by providing this lovely, rich environment for the children, then we certainly would see that education is going on. The other thing Froebel is known for is coming up with a sequence of 10 presents called the Froebel Gifts. And this is one of the relatively early ones. And the notion is that for very, very young children, before school age, you give them a collection where you give them presents to play with, these gifts to play with, one of which is a collection of square, sort of, no, right, cuboidal blocks out of which they can build things. And they get used to sort of all kinds of things through playing with these blocks. Um, lots of people have gone through Frobelian kindergartens, such as Frank Lloyd Wright, um, famous American architect. I think you see some parallels there, don't you? Yeah. Those early experiences of playing with blocks and building things and putting things together and the, the impact that that has in later life. Uh, let's just deal with this, this, this word pedagogy. I have colleagues in higher education who say, no, 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 there's pedagogy and andragogy. I'm not entirely comfortable with that debate. And some people think, well, a pedagogue is somebody who just stands at the front and tells people stuff, much like what I'm doing at the moment. But if you look at the etymology of the word there, it's from the Greek, and it describes the slave in the household who took the child to the place where learning happened. And I think that's something which most of us as teachers could identify with, the person who takes the child to the place where learning occurs for that child. Many of us, I think, in the current climate can agree with the slave bit as well, of course. Is this a problem? Well, Ofsted seem to think that it is, that the pedagogy we adopt when it comes to ICT, they're talking about ICT in an inclusive way to include computer science here, that they've seen in secondary schools and to some extent primary schools isn't as good as it should be. 
more, most interestingly for them, it's not as good as they see in other subject areas, even when it's the ICT that's involved. Um, great pedagogical skills and understanding of many of the teachers of other subjects observed in the survey. Excessive focus on particular requirements of exam accreditation. It's, un it's unkind. Is it unfair? Do you feel that we ought to be doing more about our pedagogy? They put these little grey box bits into the report. So here's the one where they're talking about... A year seven lesson. This is not what the Secretary of State would think happens in ICT lessons of its PowerPoint and then PowerPoint the following year and PowerPoint the year after that. This is a programming lesson that they're talking about here. I'll give you a moment to read the words on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to open a window outside, I suspect. I might have something clever on the front panel here. You never know. Blinds. Okay, blinds down. Oh, how's that? <laughs> okay. Um, don't let that distract you from Ofsted's words about this lesson. Um, it's not good, is it? A lesson like that. I mean, yes, it's programming. Wow, isn't that brilliant? No, it's not. I'm sure that we can teach programming. I'm sure we can teach programming just as badly as folk have been teaching PowerPoint um, year in, year out. So what do we do about this? Well, let's think a little more about pedagogy. Anybody name all three of the gentlemen on the screen behind me? This takes you back to your PGCE year, folks. Two out of three? One out of three? Thank you. Who have you got? Who did you get? Pavlov. Pavlov. No, nope, not Pav no Pavlov on the screen. But you, you're close. Gentleman on the right, on the left here is B. F. Skinner, very much into that Pavlovian. What is it? Stimulus response reward frame. If I'm going to ask you a question, if you get it right, I'll give you some Smarties. I'm not really going to give you Smarties, folks. Don't get excited. And we do this quite a lot. Okay. Anybody have a go for the gentleman in the middle? Jean Piaget, PGC coming back, flooding back, yes? <laughs> and finally on the right, Vygotsky. I'm from Roehampton, I'm a social constructivist. It's something which we have to begin most of our lectures with. So, you know, what you have here, we've, we've done this as stimulus response reward. I'll show you a video about that in a moment. Piaget, this notion of constructivism, that what you're doing when you're learning is forming a mental schema, a mental model of how the world around you works. And you do this through direct experience initially, through playing with things like throwable blocks, and you do this through more complicated manipulating symbols and language later on. But through that sort of experience experiment stuff, he characterizes learning. But the same is true of computing, remember. The same is true of when it comes to learning about a computer. What you're doing much of the time is coming up with your mental schema of what's going on inside the screen. You can't help but do that. The children you're teaching are doing that all the time that they're sat in front of a machine. They've got some mental model of what's happening there. Well, when I press click send on email, magic happens. Could be that mental schema. But perhaps one of our roles is to show that there's possibly a little more to it than merely magic. And you know, Piaget says there's two approaches to this. You've got most of the time this sort of assimilative stuff, and we've got this mental schema which new data just fits in comfortably with and reinforces those mental connections. But once in a while, you have those aha moments where it doesn't work as you expect it to, where something is different and you suddenly have to change your schema to fit in with the new data that you've been provided. And I think that's something which computing education is really good at, isn't it? That we all have those, it's not doing what I expected it to moments. Yeah? Common experience, not just me, is it? Okay, that's all right then. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we've got Lev Vygotsky, who says learning is essentially a social process. The way we learn is not simply through experiment, but we can nick other people's experiments through the technology of language, through listening to them talk about what they've experienced and reading what they've said about that. And as I say, Roehampton very much favours that Vygotskyan approach. Here's a video from the These 1950s. young people are studying in a new Skinner way. talking about teaching machines. Class in spelling. It might as well be arithmetic or algebra or grammar or in fact anything involving the use of words or symbols. Each student is using a teaching machine, a device which creates vastly improved conditions for effective study. What are teaching machines? How are they used? 
what can they teach? Who prepares the material they teach? And how does this material differ from textbooks, lectures, and educational television? So I think we're thinking of something a little like a VLE there, aren't we? But made out of <laughs> clockwork. You know, who prepares the materials? How is this different? So, you know, it's those of you who are familiar with things like mathematics and education city, which are very big in primary schools, will know the sort of, I'm going to ask you 10 multiplication questions. If you get them all right, I'm going to ask you 10 more multiplication <laughs> questions. You know, if you get them wrong, I'll ask you the same 10 multiplication questions. So, you know, we... We have a lot of that going on, I hope, not a huge amount in the things which you're doing in your classrooms. So moving on to, to one of the things which we talk about, Roehampton, we have this entirely made up, you know, there's no theory underpinning what follows, bit about learning styles when it comes to technology education, CS education, ICT education, whatever, which says, broadly speaking, people have three approaches to learning new things about technology. There's toys, there's text, and there's talk. So much of the time, we like to play with the equipment, to play with the, the machine, to play with the language, whatever. Some of the time, we like to actually have the manual there, or the textbook there, or the YouTube walkthrough there. And some of the time, we like to actually have somebody telling us what the next steps are. And of course, you know, which of these you follow is going to depend on what it is you're doing. But if I made you pick one now and say my preferred learning style generally when it comes to learning something new on my computer I would generally follow this approach could you put your hand up please if you like to just play with the toys that is not surprising folks it really isn't could you put your hand up please if you'd like to have the manual or the YouTube walkthrough or the help file very good thank you could you put your hand up please if you'd like to have somebody to talk to about this tech support helpline that's fine or a real person that would do as well okay I Look at the number of hands that went up there, okay? Not one method is better than another. But given that so many of us have learned through the let me play, let me explore, let me experiment. And I suspect if you were to ask the question of a room of professional software developers, programmers, you get just as many, possibly even more, down that sort of let me play, let me experiment. If you look at how, you know, really good, high-class high coders work, it is close to that sort of Piagetian or, you know, Frobelian. Let me explore, let me experiment, let me try things. Okay, further later on, there is more theory, I know, and I'm not denying the importance of theory. Some quotes from our new PGC students. Mm. Yeah, we know this sort of thing, don't we? That wasn't like our application. <laughs> First lecture. <laughs> First le yeah. um, in a sense, that's right, the instructional manuals are for wimps, but only because, only because the technology should be good enough that you don't need the instructional manuals. Yes. So, something for user interface yes, yes. designers there. At what point do you need the instructional manual when it comes to? Sooner or later, when you're doing your objective C coding, you're going to need to read the specification. But, but, that, but that's not the yeah. instruction manual for no. the development environment. And the manual really ought to be concerned about what you can do with this tool rather than yeah. how to use it. Interesting. Okay, a couple I more of these. Yes, oh, I know, I know. No, you know what you're talking about. I meant interesting in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not sure. <laughs> 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 I did not. I did not. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry about the spelling of program here. But look, this is how this is how my new postgrad students are learning this stuff. This is what, no matter what we've done at school or their first degree, this is the point where most of them seem to have got at this. I like this one very much. Yeah. Common experience, if we're not sure, we Google it. You know, the, yeah. the whole way we do education, no, the way we learn things has changed dramatically because of this sort of ubiquitous access to technology. So I asked them the same questions I asked you, and the clever ones say, it depends, Miles. But, you know, when I forced them to pick one, then there weren't as many in that sort of, let me just play with it, let me have the toys box. But that is still the majority position there. And what we try to do, of course, now is, is do a little bit of differentiation and provide more support for those who'd like more support. We also ask them to grade their skills on a sort of five-point Likert scale. 
notice at the top of the graph there is the stuff. We have two-thirds of our new students, these new undergraduates, straight out of school, many of them, but by no means all, saying they have no experience of programming or no knowledge of programming, despite its presence on the national curriculum and preaching to the choir here. The interesting stuff, though, is when we add in... as They do okay on the skills list. They really do. It's, it's fine. You know, what is that? That's 60% of... No, it's about two-thirds of them regard themselves as competent, proficient, or expert across that range of 18 different skills. When we ask them about knowledge, and when we ask them about understanding, those scores drop dramatically. And I think this is a failing with the way we've done ICT education thus far, that we have focused so much on the skills of using the software and not nearly enough on explaining how it works or develop it doesn't have to be explaining it's developing their understanding so if you take one thing away from this lecture if anybody's tweeting this lecture the, the tweet to send is about understanding matters yeah let's focus on developing that understanding when it comes to what we do with the children with the people we're working with um, but yeah look at the understanding one that's less than a quarter who regard themselves as competent proficient when it comes to understanding how technology works. And that, if nothing else, is called for us to do something different. OK, these are Roehampton teacher training students. These are not people who are training to be uh, you know, enrolled on a computer science course. But I don't think our picture is significantly different from what you'd find elsewhere. No evidence of that. Many, sorry, wouldn't many people argue that it doesn't matter? Oh, yes. I have a number of my students <laughs> say, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the last time I wrote a poem was probably at primary school. I don't need to know how to write poetry. I'm not using that in my job. Nevertheless, laying claim to having an education involves that experience of writing a poem or writing a piece of music, rubbish as it no doubt was, that given the role that technology plays in all of our lives, to say that we just need to be able to use this stuff, we don't need to understand how it works, seems to be saying... I don't actually need an education anymore. This, this part of reality, I'm not interested I in. Know, yeah. many people are quite happy to leave something Oh, yes. I mean, Douglas Rushkoff's program will be programmed is really very, very good on this. You know, we're getting to the point now where unless we do something about it, then the notion of digital citizenship of be, having, playing an empowered role in society is something which only comes to those who can code, really. It's not fair on our children. Hi. I'd like to pick up on that because yeah. computing technology is layered. There are different levels abstractions. of abstractions. Yeah. And the important thing is picking the right le level of abstraction, the right amount, uh, the right depth to which to go in terms of how it works. Really nice example of this is when you're looking at something like a word processor, or for that matter, a markup language like HTML. They have things in common the separation of markup from content, mm. from structure. And if you can teach those general principles about content, structure, and markup, you can understand well, not only what's going yes. on, but why it goes wrong. Yes, yeah? absolutely. So when you take that paragraph mark from Word and you move it from one place to another, you suddenly understand why the, the formatting of the paragraph goes with it. Because you know what the structure is underlying and how it's doing it. So you don't need to know the algorithm, but you do need to know something about how it works and what to understand what's going on. I bet it still doesn't explain how Word puts pictures where it does. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's so archaic. Yeah. I think there's also a fundamental point as teachers beyond our subjects as part of our job to persuade children that they can understand the world around them, mm. whether yes. or not they mm. remember what they learned. And if they take away the message that if you choose to look, yes. you can go down that level. Yeah. And, and that learning is an interesting thing to do. You know, we, if you go back to kindergarten or nursery or whatever you're going to call it, School is fun because there's all of this stuff to discover. At some point between the age of five and eighteen, it becomes we've got to do school. <laughs> do you know, it's it, starts young, it, starts it starts younger than eleven. They have to, they have to understand that, that it isn't the high priests. You know, mm. They have to understand that whether or not they yet have yeah. gone to the I'm not, I'm not is suggesting this is the way it should be. No, I, no, understand no, I know that. And as Simon says, there is no then. It's us. Mm. You know, that's the message. To get to the children too, you know, it's what you do. That's Sorry, make I that. think a, a very nice analogy is with the uh, something like the London Underground system. If you find your, if you try and find your way around a city like London, you can go to where you want to go by underground. Okay, and what happens then is you get to a station and you walk a 
you need to yes. <laughs> And you don't know that these two stations are actually only five minutes walk apart because what you've done is you've gone from station to station on the ground. Yeah. And, it, and if you're not careful, if all you do is learn the surface stuff, mm. you never actually get to see the connections between them. And so you don't become effective at navigating your way around this body of knowledge. And, and what's more... <laughs> stations. Yes. And what's more... When it comes to the technology, the technology is going to move on. You know, the exactly. children who my students are going to be teaching next September, by the time they get to university or into the world of work, it's, you know, we'll be looking at an entirely different system of machines, operating systems, um, applications. It's going to be wholly different. But that understanding will carry through, just as even Mr. Gove acknowledged in his speech. Sorry, just to extend yeah. that analogy a little bit, if you then get on the bus, you have no clue where to get off. Because you don't know what anything looks like. Yeah. Yeah? And that's the thing, our, our, our students, if we're not careful, they end up with this, this station view of the world and you stick them on the bus hmm. and they're lost. It's and the patterns, the isn't it? It's, it's the patterns, yeah. it's spotting the patterns, yeah. it's seeing the similarities between okay. them. I'm going to show you one or two more slides. Okay. No, 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 you're fine. You're absolutely fine. So what I've done this year is then cross-tab the two. So we look at that understanding score and then we look at what they said on the learning style thing. And look what happens. Those who do the exploration, who do the toy stuff, the play with it, score more highly on that understanding measure than those who have somebody explaining patiently what it is that they do. Yeah? I don't know which direction causality flows. Is it that if I, can un if I understand the computer, then I'm much happier playing? Or is it if I play with the computer, I actually get that understanding of how it works? Or at least I'm prepared to tick the box to say I understand how it works. Just... Anybody's thoughts on that? Do you think it's play leads to understanding or the other way around? <laughs> Fine. Okay, that's <laughs> helpful. <laughs> um, I think one of the issues with students is some students don't have the confidence to play. And they're really scared about getting something wrong and they don't want to... It's... Yeah, I mean, in the case of my students, it's getting better because we're deliberately stop stepping back from teaching them stuff. You know, it's an easier life, isn't it? You know, just set the task, set the challenge, make it a creative thing, and then, you know, let them discover. Fail. Yes, mm -hmm. failing is good. So Not all of the time, but fail better. Fail no. Yeah. Isn't the problem with play that you get to a comfort zone, I'm happy doing those things that I can do, and you don't actually... Which is the role for the educator. You see this in an early years classroom where, you know, allegedly in many early years it is play-based learning. That the teachers, the nursery assistants, the practitioners step in and challenge the child to move out of their comfort zone, to get some new experiences, to move from the assimilation of Piaget into the accommodation of Piaget. So there is, you know, we, I'm not saying we're going to be out of a job because of, you know, more experiential play-based learning hard. I was just going to say, I think also computer is properly set up is a good play tool. It's a tool within which we can play, you get results and you can yeah. see what you do. It's a good simulator. Yes. Um, if it was a bad simulator, you wouldn't have it's not a good, <laughs> not a good system. Okay. I think one of your old student quotes that you had one word that said, you've got a tree and how to break it computer to incompetence. That's the understanding that allows you to play. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, more power to the Raspberry Pi Foundation's elbow. <laughs> Even if you do break it, it's only 25 quid. <laughs> okay. And a long wait until it arrives. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, moving more on to you know, where people have actually tried to address what sort of approaches work particularly well when it comes to technology, when it comes particularly well to computing. Gentleman with a beard, anybody in the room? Sorry? Puppet, absolutely, Seymour Puppet, taken a while ago with a turtle in front of him there, okay? And this notion, which was central to Puppet's view of education, Puppet, remember, worked with Piaget, um, that we learn it's not just through experiment and exploration, it's not just through talking to other people that we learn, but it's in, through building things for other people to see that we learn best, that at its heart... Education is a creative, or should be, a creative process. And particularly when it comes to our subject domain, you know, the notion of learning computer science without creating programs for other people. I'm sure you could do it, but it really wouldn't be the best way to go about that, is it? You know, you want that experience of making something for other people. That's how we learn best, says Puppet. And so, you know, giving children the tools to build things, to experiment, to explore, but not just playing, also producing you know, knowledge artifacts, as he calls them.
Um, this, of course, is embedded in the scratch thing as well, of this iterative process of creating things, playing and sharing. Look at the words which are coming up there. Mitch Resnick, remember one of Papert's PhD students. So we're doing this with Roehampton students. So our first-year ICT specialists have to go and play with scratch and create their own little educational game in there. This is very much in the guise of Skinner and behaviors and what is four times four. If you get it right, you know what's going to come next, don't you? Another question. But we have that sort of let's build build something. And this not only embodies their understanding of programming such as it is, but also something of the educational process. You know, what sort of rewards do you give? How many times do you repeat the same question before you move on? Um, this doesn't show up brilliantly, but have a read of that. Yeah? Anybody like to have a go for dates and attribution here? It's Papert, 41 years ago, 1971. Isn't that astonishing? Yeah, that so much of that is so right. And we're kind of coming round to this now. Um, you know, visionary, visionary stuff. Um, and moving on from, from constructionism to look at some more up-to-date things. So Mark Prensky, Digital Natives, who here believes in the myth? No, believes in the notion of the digital... <laughs> oh, sorry. Believes in the idea of the digital native, that the children that are in school these days, young undergraduates, um, broadly speaking, they think differently to the likes of my generation because they've grown up around technology. Okay, right. I'm supposed to put a footnote at this point about this has been largely discredited, etc. I think, you know, there may well be some truth in this. You know, people from... Oh, yes. Did you, I mean, the, the, the Prensky division is between the digital native and the digital immigrant. But other people are using terms like digital visitor or digital citizen or whatever, yeah. No, I, well, it could be that. You know, the ones who say that, take the line that this is a myth would see it in those terms. But Prensky's argument and the sort of thing which Susan Greenfield talks about when it comes to brain plasticity is because of this technology, they think in a different way. It's not simply that they've got different toys from us, but access to Google so from... They yes, I mean, you know, yes, in terms of... The, they do see the world in a different way, I suppose. They have learned different things from us. Okay. But you only learn to think in a simple way as well, because you've got to, you've got to think of the idea that, I'll use the, the idea that, all right, 1996, I was learning computer, I was learning my ICT, I was yeah. degrees, so forth. By the time you got, but you had to use a combination of methods to get the answer that you wanted. Now, you will have one answer. Hmm. Never known a gen this generation Interesting. Never known this period without Google. Yeah. Um, because of that, they have only one place in which they know where to oh, get yes. the answer. Yeah. To show them, I yeah. showed them Wolfram Alpha last week, and they nearly <laughs> grabbed a bit. They never could seen imagine. Anything like this before. But that was the thing. Yeah. They, they've only ever been taught that the only answer and the only solution is Google. The only, the only answer, the only way to communicate is Facebook. They are now so drilled in that. They don't use, and they're drilled in this method. Never since the Reformation has one organization controlled more people's access to information exactly. than Google now. So, another hand up. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's the line which Susan Greenfield takes that this has done them no favors at all. Prensky is a little more positive about this. He says, This is how digital natives, if you'll allow me to use the term for at least the next five minutes, like to learn. Any of that which you don't see in your students? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, my students. Your students? My students, yeah. They do this? No, no I mean, uh, they, they don't want to work to do, uh, to do group work. Oh. They don't want to make decisions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this isn't they the case. Don't right, yeah. They connect and express yeah. and share their opinions. They want to be spoon fed. Ah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. So Prensky's got it wrong. Online, yeah. This <laughs> is easier. Think, I think if you challenge them, I challenge them in the right way. Yeah. It would work. It's the same idea as, this, as the digital leaders' idea. 
Yeah, you give them a project, I give them a project, but they said, you've got to come to me and tell me what you want to learn. Or you come up with an idea for somebody else to go find, and they'll go find it. The second you give them a social network in which to go and use that, yes. to do that, yes. then they will love that because they are already using that social network in order to learn. So you are pushing it. But if they like to be told what to do, if they're unfamiliar with the concept, or they ex put that concept yeah. in something more comfortable, then they're much more open to, to suggest Very interesting, Ian. I think he's just being disingenuous because what he's actually saying is, I think this is what can be done now technology is available. And he's then completely abusing yeah. the younger generation by putting his words into their mouth. Quite possibly. Quite possibly. Um, we will move on soon. Go on. Do you think the woman behind the Gogis tutor could also look at that and say, yeah, that's what... Oh! <laughs> Has it changed? I think this was how I was when I was at school. So I was born the same year as the internet. Am I a digital native? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think of myself as a digital native. I started programming at 13, but there we go. And I'm unusual. But it just strikes me that there's, uh, you can't make this assertion without taking into account the age and maturity of the student. Of course, yeah. And actually, um, students who are sort of 11, 12, 13 are more like this than when they're 18. <laughs> And I'm curious about why. <laughs> but, yes. And in yes. fact, once they get yeah. 25, 26, they become like this again. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, I've made the point elsewhere that the amount of freedom you get about what you learn in nursery and the amount of freedom you get about what you study for your PhD, broadly speaking, not dissimilar, you get to pursue your own interests. Okay, somebody's got to fund one, but you know, <laughs> but in the middle, not so much. You know? It isn't just that. It's about the social interaction as well. They actually mm. want to discuss. When, when we have mature students, they want to discuss what they're learning. Yeah. They want to interact with it. They want to take control and make decisions and reflect. When they're 18, 19, they don't. Hmm. They just want us to tell them what they've got to know. I'm, as I say, I'm curious about why. Yeah. Prensky says there are different roles because of this, that we let students do the things which they're good at, and we as teachers do things that we're good at. And so the, he comes up with this notion of the partnering pedagogy. And you start to see that in some of the interesting projects that are going on. So for instance, the Apps for Good stuff. Apps for Good has a real potential to change curriculum. ICT is a bit broken. Apps for Good gives schools an opportunity to do a really innovative course. I think teaching young people that they can change things, that they can find their own solutions for things is very powerful. And then I think along the way, they learn all those job skills that the employers are crying out for. How to present, how to think, how to work in teams, to think critically, do the research, um, all of which just makes for a fantastic program, I think. I'm conscious that the time passes, and so you can watch the video in your own time if you'd like. Flipped seminar session, how's that? Okay. Um, this stuff on the board, what am I describing here? Or what are these six characteristics seen as being... Might, what might these be related to? I did do a little bit of a... This is where we're going with the lecture, so I might have given them a game away. Okay. <laughs> this is the sort of thing that the enthusiasts say about game-based learning. That when you're playing a computer game, you're very focused on a particular goal. There's something which you're trying to achieve. There's a clear level of interactivity. You do something with the joypad or the keyboard or whatever, the computer reacts in a certain predictable, less predictable sort of way. You know how well you're doing as you're going on. There is a strong sense of progression that level three is harder than level one. There are problems involved. You know, um, Stephen Johnson says that, you know, the dirty secret of computer games is how hard they are that people stick at these and really persevere. And, you know, if you're doing the thing well, then you get into this Chichemini High state of flow where time seems to just fly by, much like it does for all of us with our marking, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> the, I think, though, that the same things are true for many of us when it comes to programming. We are quite clearly focused on the goal that we're trying to achieve with the bit of code. We know whether it's working. You know, back in the old days, you know, long stack of cards, syntax error sort of thing. You know, you do kind of have that. Sorry, that's the feedback thing. You also have the interactivity. You change a line of code, that changes what happens on the computer, all being well. There is, I'm sure, you know, a sense of progression that we, this process of coding as apprenticeship, that we move from legitimate 
participation on the periphery to becoming better and better and better at what we do. We are doing difficult things. And you know, the reason why computer science in school is going to appeal to a lot of children is because it is intellectually challenging. At least it is if you do it properly. And you know, you'll, many of you, I'm sure, will have had that experience of sitting at the computer for hour on end and being acutely unaware of, of time passing and you know, food needing, eating, and so on. Um, <laughs> James Paul Geese says we, learn, we should learn from the video games industry and the way that they create these video games to get those sorts of effects, those factors, that's something which we ought to bring inside the classroom. He identifies 36 ways in which video games sort of see learning, sort of the principles of learning which underpin computer games, of which the first seven are up on the screen there. I'm sure that a lot of these ideas you could apply just as easily to computer science education. Learning about coming to appreciate design and design principles core to the learning experience. Is that not going to be the case of what we're doing in our classrooms as well as how computer games work? So I think there are parallels there. Um, we don't have time to watch Raphael's video, but it's brilliant. This is one of the things our students have to do. Jay McGonigal goes further and says, actually, let's take these ideas of how computer games work and apply them to all sorts of problems out in the real world. And of course, you're seeing things like Code Academy. Anybody still doing Code Academy? You start at the beginning of the year. Hmm. Okay, well done, Matt. Okay, I kind of gave up fairly early on. But you have that sort of badges and reward structure in there and that level of interactivity. So that's sort of let's take the game idea and apply it to something else. We're starting to see. How are we doing for time? Not too bad. Um, Downs and Siemens talk about this notion of connectivism as a new learning theory, a learning theory geared towards a digital age. They say at its heart, learning is about making connections between the little gray cells, as Poirot put it, you know, between one neuron and another. Unless the brain has changed, it's very hard to say that learning has taken place, they would argue. But it's also about connecting ideas together. And I think this is a really helpful way of conceptualizing the learning process. That, okay, we have all of these ideas. It's um, Steve's underground analogy, isn't it? You know, how are the, the, the stations connected together is where so much of the learning is taking place. And also, it's the connections between the people. And that's something that is really important to acknowledge. So they write about it. Knowledge continues to grow and evolve. Access to what is needed is more important than what the learner currently possesses. And, you know, the, the point about they just learn by Googling stuff, that is how we learn. It is how many of them learn. There are such good resources out there. So, you know, I want to teach myself how to build a search Davis. engine. A I can find a course for that online and I'm now. Sebastian really Fun, high man. quality Research materials. Connect University with a global community of people Fellow. who are doing this So you probably thing. remember me from a I class that attracted over 100,000 students. And we're teaching a new class now together with David. So, you David, what is this class all about? Yeah. So the course is Introduction to Computer Science, Building a Search Engine. We won't spend time watching the video, but it's the people as well as the ideas and, you know, Tobin writing about this notion of the personal learning network. And this is something which I think is a big part of that process of, mo of, of moving from learning stuff to becoming part of a community. That this notion of the, the software craftsmanship, learning um, to code as apprenticeship is about connecting to the other people. Which brings me on to sort of Wenger, Etienne Wenger, and this notion of learning as social process. The stuff down here, we do very, very well. Learning as experience, learning through making meaning is the stuff which we focus on very much, I think, in many of our lessons. And learning as practice, this notion of the practical writing code, solving problems, that's a big part of what we do. But the other stuff, up at the top there, learning is becoming part of a community. Learning is taking on an identity is perhaps not something which happens in very many of our lessons, but perhaps it ought to more. So we move now to thinking of, of this as apprenticeship and you know, things like Young Rewired State. Um, well, my name is James Cunningham. Um, this is my second year taking part in Young Rewired State. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to put a plug in for your talk then? Yeah. <laughs> you want to know more about Young Rewired State? Right. Come to. Uh, B07 20 Fine, okay, I'll skip on then. <laughs> okay, so you have then this notion of apprenticeship, and this is uh, Hoover Rush and I, um, brilliant little O'Reilly book called Apprenticeship Patterns, looking at the first stages of how you become a craftsman, a software craftsman, how you become a software developer, and all of the different strategies that they suggest those people at the, at the start of their career would be pursuing. Are those things which you can bring inside the classroom? I'm sure they are. You know, have they got the breakable toys on there? Yeah. 
I can't, I can't see it on this screen. You can see it on the bigger screen. Oh, yeah, somewhere in the center of the thing. You know, coming back to having the confidence to play with the computer and not worry about breaking things, of, of making something which doesn't work, our fail and then fail better the next time around. It's such an important part of the learning process. So this is done in pattern language. Anybody familiar with pattern languages? Okay, it's worth looking at, looking into this. They, they go back to Christopher Alexander talking about pattern language for building towns, a, a sort of human scale architecture, thinking, okay, towns basically have all of these sort of repeating patterns which you use for, you know, similar problems occur in all sorts of urban situations, so similar solutions would apply. Not always the same problems, not always going to be the same solutions, but let's think about the patterns here and generalize this. This caught on with sort of software craftsmanship crowd with, with this book particularly, Design Patterns, Reusable Object Oriented Software, and folk have now applied that to teaching strategies as well. And if you think about your lesson plans, you all look too old to still be writing lesson plans. I hope you're not having to write lesson plans. Um, that you have similar things which you do in, to solve similar problems. And this is one way of codifying that. So do, I mean, it's, it's an approach. Think in terms of what are my reusable teaching strategies for this, for that, for the other. What are the problems I'm trying to solve here? I'm running out of time. Um, we've done this far too much particularly when it comes to curriculum, but also when it comes to teaching. I think particularly if you're working to an exam specification, these are the requirements. I'm going to design a brilliant course, a brilliant lesson, a brilliant curriculum around that. I'm going to implement that. I'm going to do my, you know, my unit testing. I'm going to do testing. I'm going to check that they've got it. And then, you know, we'll laminate our lesson plans, as Nick Gibb is proposing, or just sort of tweak things for the next year, the sort of evaluation that we do, which is fine. You know, waterfall methodology on many, many syllabuses still we know. But there are other ways. So, you know, you look at the agile software development ideas, um, which are in, you know, implicit in a lot of what CAS is doing. But actually, individuals and interactions are what matter inside the classroom. Think about the children you're teaching. Think about how you're interacting with them. But not so much working software, but working knowledge is far more important, surely, than the documentation when it comes to teaching, just as it is in agile software development. We don't talk about customers, except in some schools, I suppose. We talk about children or students, but collaborating with them, seeing it in friendsky terms as a partnering approach. And yeah, responding to change, of going off track in the lesson, of being willing to take countless interruptions from people who think that they're being helpful. <laughs> <laughs> now? <laughs> Later? Well. Later? Yeah. Um, okay, so you then have the sort of principles of agile development, which I've not got time in there, in too small a font for you to read now. Look them up on the internet. Google will find those for you. And then you can move beyond that, and then you've got people like this, man, the, the software craftsmanship crowd saying, okay, these things are important, but actually, let's move beyond that. And it's not just working software or working knowledge, but actually well-crafted stuff. And is that not something you'd want in your teaching? Is that not what you want in your classroom? Okay, responding to change, but actually getting better and better as we go on. And I think that sort of step beyond the agile pedagogy is worth exploring. Um, yeah, individuals and interactions matter, but a community of professionals, a community, a learning community in your classroom matters too. Um, so where does the theory fit into that? Um, my guess is that certainly at primary school, you most of the theory, you know, think about science education as we've done it in primary practice of we focus on the experiments, we focus on the, the investigations, and then bring the theory in through that route. Is that not we'd al what we'd also want when it comes to computing? That We want them to have that experience of writing code, creating software, but also bring in theory on the back of that. At what point do we swap over? Well, sooner or later in an undergraduate course, you are going to be bringing in, you know, theoretical computer science. At some point, I suspect, in secondary schools, you'd want to, just as you would in science education in secondary school, move away from the purely experimental approach to saying, actually, let's just think about the ideas here and think about you know, concepts like abstraction and concepts like patterns and so on and see how that actually makes, allows us to make much more sense of that experimental, experiential data. Which brings us to the elephant in the room. Okay, so the Bridget Somex says, if you want to do anything really innovative in the school system, you've got to get assessment right. 
And this is a challenge, you know, that, that it's fine saying, yeah, we want them to work collaboratively on projects, but then they've got to do an exam or a controlled assessment on their own. Um, how do you reconcile the two? Well, one of the ways which people are thinking about is this sort of badges thing of, you know, when I do something, I get a badge to demonstrate that I've been assessed of doing that particular granular bit of stuff. And believe it or not, that seems to be, well, there's the hint that that's where they're heading with national curriculum assessment. We're moving away from levels to, you know, individual mastery statements. I'm not sure that we'll get badges to sell onto our... Actually, we might yet get badges to sell onto our <laughs> uniforms. Um, you're seeing people, clever people, doing interesting things. This is at Infernal Depart on Twitter saying, OK, how does badges then apply to computing education? Well, you know, level 6C on digital studies is one. I'm a co-dude. What is it? Co-dude. <laughs> I am a digital creative. You know, you've got your badge. I suspect there are... You know, multiple levels of those badges. You've got, you know, I could use digital technologies covers a multitude, I suspect. But you know, that recognition of granular, I can do this thing, and I've got some recognition, some accreditation for that. And Mozilla are really into this stuff now. Doug Belshaw going to be running open badges for Mozilla. They've got the whole sort of infrastructure on the back end, so this becomes a portable digital badge which you can put on your blog, which you can put in such a place that people can verify that somebody in authority has recognized that you have those skills. Um, but I don't know. Who here is sort of involved with undergraduate admissions to computer science degrees, if anybody. Okay, what do you think, folks? Russell Group University, students come along, you know, wanting a place on a computer science course. Which is going to matter more, their grade in the A-level or the projects that they've contributed to the portfolio of code that they produce? Grade in the A-level. I wonder. I wonder. Yeah. Getting in or getting well, I, was, well for, I mean, you're going to have to, you know, you've got certain minimum standards to meet, but if you've got more people than you've got places for, so on what basis do you award those? Yeah. The ultimate crux would be you've got to be the grade. You have got to get the grade, but I think if it's a case of getting to interview or the written statements, personal statements, then I have contributed to these open source projects or I have these apps on the App Store or iTunes or wherever they go. That's going to count for something. You'll still have to get the A-level grade. Don't get me wrong. You still have to get the A-level grade. But in making the decision between two candidates who otherwise appear similar... It's the sort of thing they do with the art, for example. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's... Uh, as you know, my, my students are trained to be teachers rather than computer scientists, but we want them to talk about what they've done with children. Yes, we set a certain tariff and they've got to get so many UCAS points, but the ones who get those offers are the ones who've been going and doing reading in the local primary school or help out with the brownies or the guides or the scouts or the cubs or whatever. That The people you've been working with, the personal learning network stuff, matters. That The project you've participated in matter. And the portfolio of stuff that you've produced matters. Um, it's hard to move away from, you know, gold standards, GCSE specifications, but actually think beyond that would be my suggestion, that getting children who, you know, writing code and contributing to open source projects and going to young rewired state. Sorry, I'm allowed to say it again. <laughs> 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 Taking part in hack days and so on. That is going to be, you know, the chance of captivating their enthusiasm, of producing people who are lifelong learners, I think, is easier that way than, you know, I'm going to get an A star when it comes to GCSE or do really well in my A2s, whatever. I could be wrong. <laughs> okay, um, very, gosh, we have overrun. Um, yeah, this is the journey from Roehampton to Birmingham. Um, that's fine. Google will do that for me. It tells me exactly where to do, where to go. If I pay attention to my phone, it will sort of navigate me one step of the way. If I want to get from Roehampton to Birmingham, that is a really sensible thing to do. If I want to explore the landscape on the way, then this is, okay, moderately useful. But there is, my suggestion to you is that there is more to learning than the journey that is actually the landscape you're exploring which matters here. Rather than final destination, this is the, the optimal route. 
let's think a little more about the places that we travel through on the way to that destination. So yeah, over the left-hand side, this is kind of how we do things. We think in terms of a linear sequence of stuff. It's a, uh, um, learning is a journey. The lesson is structured in a certain way, and that's where learning takes place. We have a blog, which is one thing after another, and all of the other stuff. On the right-hand side, if you swap the metaphors to spatial ones rather than temporal ones, a landscape to explore, we learn from the library or from Google as much as we do from being in the lesson that the wiki where we're collaborating together and making those connections is as powerful, possibly a more powerful tool than the blog is, that let's play games rather than watch films where we're more in control of what we're happening, what's happening. I'm so sorry that I've overran, uh, but thank you very much for your patience. If you want to get in touch, I'm here. Um, come talk to me, but if you'd rather do it in the digital domain, there's an email address and a Twitter account and a blog which I very, very rarely update, I'm afraid. But thank you all very much.